This is where I started. I think I was probably seven. It was very hot, West African. It was, it was either summer, summer, summer or rainy season, but it was hot. Sawed off wooden tennis racket, my dad put it in my hand, go over there. Shift your weight from side to side. Keep your eye on the ball. Onye, 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 keep your eye on the ball. Come on now, keep your eye on the ball. Okay, 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 side to the side. Left foot forward, okay, okay. Not bad. Here we go. Another one coming. Oh, backhand. Oh, oh, Onye. You forgot to switch your grip. If you want it to stay in the court, you have to do the right technique. My father was my tennis coach. As my two younger brothers and I traversed the ocean back and forth between West Africa and the Midwest, I grew up between Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and um, northern and southwestern Nigeria. Tennis was a constant. We were on the tennis court if my dad could help it every single night. And it was all about movement technique. If you want the ball to go where you want it to go, you have to be in the proper technique. Sit down, legs forward, make sure you bend. Rotation in the hip socket. Make sure the grip is right on your racket. If you don't switch it on your backhand, your racket ends up facing the sky, and your ball ends up... Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I think that in some ways my dad was hopeful that tennis would be something that his biracial children, my mother is a German-American Mennonite from southern Ohio, <clears throat> that his biracial, bicultural children would have something neutral that would be consistent across the complicated cultural terrain that he knew that we were about to face as we grew up. A skill, something that would be concrete, that we could hold on to, and that we, could, we would be judged on our, on our ability to perform it in its simplicity. And whether the ball was in the court would be the only determining factor of whether we were right or whether we were wrong. I think my father had really strong and good intentions for us as children. There was something for me, though, the level of emotion that I felt, training my body in motion, learning those skills, the joy that would happen when you'd feel that perfect sound of the ball in the right center of the racket, the sweet spot, and then the utter disappointment when it wouldn't come in. It just wasn't enough. It, as I got older, the game didn't seem important enough to feel so strongly for. I wanted something more, and, and I remember being 14 years old in Fort Myers, Florida, and dramatically, in true, you know, foreshadowing of my performative future, I threw the racket down. This just doesn't matter. And I strode off the tennis court and onto the dance floor. <laughs> I started dancing first in my high school dance team, and we learned the jitterbug and the shag and a little, uh, some kind of line dance to YMCA. <laughs> and we did a tour of the senior citizen centers in South Florida, and they would pull the wheelchairs back and put us on the uh, cafeteria linoleum, and we would dance. And they loved it. And I remember my hand being squeezed and the uh, shaking, shimmering blue eyes of an old lady as she looked up at me and said, oh, thank you, thank you, young lady, thank you so much. And I just remember the squeeze of that hand and feeling inherently like there was something electrical, something actual that she was getting, that she was wringing from my warm hand, open and um, sweaty from having just performed. And I was hooked <clears throat> on that activity on the connectivity of my body's tool and instrument and movement bringing me into intimate, somehow, contact with other people in the space at the same time. I studied jazz dance. I continued to study as I went into college. I was not a dance major. I was an English literature major with a minor in economics, planning to go to law school. And, um, but I took my classes on the side. I studied jazz. I studied ballet. I got into a dance company at Florida A&M University, where I then got opened up to a cornucopia of African-American dance forms, tap, traditional jazz forms, 
traditional West African forms, black concert dance. I was also studying at Florida State University in their dance department. I studied traditional modern dance forms, gram technique, Lewiski-based technique, more ballet. As I moved more and further and further into the formal study of dance, I started to see maybe, maybe, I don't know if my dad knew or not, some of the things that he might have been protecting me from. Because here, without the ball and the line, value was determined by a more shady measure, culture, right? On one side of the railroad tracks, because in Tallahassee, Florida, Florida A&M University is on one side of the railroad tracks, and Florida State University is on another side of the railroad tracks. Florida A&M is a historically black college. Florida State is a regular big state school. Go Seminoles. <laughs> on one side, my training in the African-American community, rhythm was a value, being able to drop your weight was a value, being able to communicate and dance with people, with people, in communication with people was a value, being able to feel a sense of collective time was a value, even if you didn't really know what the count was. On the other side, being balanced was a value, being on time was a value, not missing class was a value, keeping your pelvis lined up underneath your chest, top of your head was a value, being skinny was a value. <laughs> and I started to become self-conscious about aspects of my body, the shape of my derriere, parts that stuck out and didn't fall into the sort of vertical line that was a value in more Western-based forms. But being a sort of, as you could tell from the beginning, a little bit belligerent, I was like, why are the rules of the game like this? These feelings that I'm having about the way I'm being talked to at the ballet bar, about being told to, I can't stick my butt in anymore. <laughs> That's the shape that it is, right? I was a little belligerent. Why are the rules like that? I don't want to be focused on that. I want to be focused on this feeling, this kinesthetic feeling. And so I started digging in. Deidre Sklar, in Five Premises to a Culturally Sensitive Approach to Dance, writes that dance is an embodied cultural knowledge. To know a dance, though, you always have to go beyond the movement. To really understand a dance, you have to understand the person doing the dance, the history of the dance, the people around the person doing the dance, the roles that all those peoples play, the cultural values of the community that created the dance, and how the aesthetics and the way the dance is taught reflect all of those things. And so I dug in and started realizing and recognizing things, some, some things. Oh, ballet comes from the court of King Louis XIV. They wore corsets back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Who, okay, now I get it, right? In the court, People promenaded in with their hand on their bow's arm, hence the bar. Hence the hierarchy. Whoever is down front and center, closest to the king, has more political power, more access to land, more access to gold. Everyone in the court of King Louis XIV had to learn to dance. That's how they got in. Ah, okay, information. I get it now, I understand. Modern dance. Modern dance came about by a desire to rebel against these sort of traditional dance forms. The desire for an individual to be able to pick and choose what was important to them. What concepts, what ideas, what aesthetics, what mode of teaching a dance, what mode of performing a dance, where I want to perform a dance. Hey, I get to choose. I get to be a creative agent in culture. Oh, that sounds like that's for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, right? You guys are getting to know me now. I want to set the rules. I love movement, but I want to set my own rules. So I said, great. You know what I like? I like dancing with people. You know what I like? I'm, I came from this. So I, I, how about I just dance down here? <laughs> and there's a lot of forms that do that. Tai Chi. Yoga. West African dance. Salsa. House dance, Chicago. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, I spent the next 10 or 15 years or so traveling and journeying through dances, cross-cultural dances that had this stance as their vortex, continuing to identify as a modern dancer, creating forms, right, creating my own forms, teaching my own styles of dance that had a central vortex through which various styles of dance could 
come together, be in conversation, sort of collaborate, if you will. Capoeira. Break dancing. Now, don't get me wrong, I was never a break dancer. <laughs> <laughs> but I had some good friends, my people in Denver, who taught me a lot. I'm a dancer. Movement is my medium. This body is my instrument. You have one, too. <clears throat> Movement is actually the way you learned how to be in your body. I was just reading last night, and I'm sure there's lots of people in the room that could help me explain this better, but that the synapses of the brain, when your baby is first born, they're really more like a general guideline, like you might want to go in that direction, but they kind of leave it open. I like that, <laughs> right? And so a baby who has kind of gotten to the point, maybe they're sitting up, or they're in this position, they're sitting up, and they see, oh my God, shiny. Ah. Uh, I want it. You're imagining the drool, yeah. <laughs> oh. Right? Reach. They reach their limit of their comfort zone. But the desire, the seeing of that thing, the shiny, they want it so bad that they go ahead and make the leap beyond comfort zone. And in that moment, they discover cross-lateral movement. Yeah? Many of you understand that cross-lateral movement and its effect on brain development is huge, yeah? So movement as a catalyst, as an initiator, as a way that we understand our environment. Somewhere along the line, I became a teacher. And here I was, I showed up in a modern dance department. Now, modern dance departments, like the one where I was being told to tuck in, right, have traditionally in the United States focused mostly on ballet and modern dance technique. Even though the United States being part of the African diaspora, which we are, has within its history and within its culture a cornucopia of forms of dance that have developed from West African movement styles, from the juke joint to the minstrel stage to the lindy hop of the Savoy to jazz dancing to the dancing that you see on Broadway, all the way to what you see all around you, all over the world, in the form of the various myriad forms of hip-hop dance. And the interaction of our Western dance tradition and our African dance tradition has been very, 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 very rich. But we still, in the way that we codify training within the academic institutions, tend to lean towards one side. So I showed up and I was teaching them all of this kind of stuff, and people were like, I feel like I'm losing my technique. <laughs> well, you, I mean, you guys are getting to know me. I'm all about technique. I said, well, what do you mean by that? What does the word technique mean? Doesn't it, I got out my dictionary, doesn't it technically, no pun intended, mean how you accomplish something? The, the way that you accomplish something? Oh, yeah, I guess so. So, as time went by, my students started to absorb and recognize that they had at their disposal and in their own cultural history this wide range of forms, forms that came from two vastly divergent cultures with very different reference points, right? And that in that widely divergent range of movement technologies, we had the ability to access our brain's power in the most varied myriad of ways, and that we can access dances and movement's ability to communicate in culture in very, 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 very diverse ways. My idea is this. If you're a person that is working in technologies, that is working to develop new technologies that are going to affect the body, talk to a dancer. Because if we're not developing the full range of our bodies, ability to move, if we're not developing the full range of our primary technology, our primary um, intermediary between us and our environment, how do we know what we need, what else we need? Does that make sense? <laughs> so along the way, as I was teaching this, these young dancers, I came across the work of Alan Lomax. Alan Lomax is uh, mostly known for his recordings of blues, of blues music. He also did this one very important project with Ermgard Bartinioff. 
and it was a choreometrics of dance project in which he linked traditional technological ways of getting food, of organizing societies, perhaps in complex um, structures, irrigation, where water would come from one level down to another for the rice to grow, of metal versus wooden tools, and link them to the ways traditional cultures dances, danced. Wooden tool people tended to dance like this. People that danced with, people that worked with metal tools tended to dance like this. People that had complex systems of irrigation tended to dance in spirals. Does that make sense? <laughs> right? Cultures that lived close to the equator where a woman could strap a baby to her back and go back out to the farm and keep farming, tended to dance in ways that the hips and the head and the torso moved off of its center. Cultures where men produced more of the food where it was cold tended to dance with straight up and down, right? Keeping the head and the tail lined up. Ah, more information. Makes sense. The ways that we dance are somehow linked to the ways that we actually use technology or that our ancestors used technology. Cultures that do heel and toe pointing, like ballet styles in Western Europe, tend to come from cultures that rode horses. So I'm on my horse, I'm riding along. I see an opportunity to shoot some game. In order to balance and get my bow and arrow out, I have to stand up in the stirrup and point my toe down. And at the moment that I pull back and release that arrow and catch my intended game, I am epitomizing this action. Dance forms where this became a value, cultures where this kind of movement became a value, were cultures whose very survival depended upon it. Am I making my case for movement as technology? <laughs> <clears throat> I was recently honored to be at a symposium, a micro-symposium for emerging technologies and their potential for interaction with the arts. And there was a woman in Suk Choi who was making a presentation about how one technology moves into another technology. And she gave this example of sort of the interface for music and how, as you notice, they still have that picture of a tape deck. Some of you guys have never seen a tape deck. Right? Some of you younger ones have never seen So why is that picture there? And amongst the computer programmers, they were like, ah, oh, you know, we have to figure out how to get rid of some of these holdovers. And I said, oh, no, but that's the body. That's the symbol for the body memory, for the movement memory. Technologies are now being created where robots, little nanorobots, can flow like liquid and be injected into our hearts to eat up the cholesterol. Yeah? I just hope that the scientists that are developing that technology take a dance class sometimes. Yeah. <laughs>